Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up to him and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose, the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has from the time, ba- but she has from the time I came in not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We're going to have story day today by hearing two stories. The first of which is uh, the one we just heard about a man named Simon, who is a Pharisee, a good and righteous man, and who invites his Pharisee good and righteous friends to his house for dinner, and he invites Jesus too. We aren't told if he was intrigued by Jesus and wanted to meet him because he was genuinely interested, although sometimes that happened, or if perhaps he was, he was uh, skeptical, suspicious of Jesus, and, and wanted to have him over to, to test him, that happened a lot, or if maybe Jesus was starting to develop kind of celebrity rock status at this time, and, and he wanted the status of being seen with him. That happens still, of course. We are told that whatever is the reason, during dinner there was a very, very unexpected and extremely awkward thing that happened. A woman, uninvited, unwelcome, crying out loud, for crying out loud, came into the room where Simon and his Pharisee friends and Jesus were having dinner. And she, Luke says, she was a sinner. And everybody knew that because everybody knew her. Well, actually, they knew her reputation. And because of her reputation, my goodness, was it ever awkward when she showed up at dinner just as the servants were setting out the salads. It got worse. The woman, in a ridiculously inappropriate public display of affection, fell down at Jesus' bare feet and hugged them and her tears actually made Jesus' feet wet 
And, and so even as she kept crying, she began to dry his bare feet with her hair. It got worse. It got scandalous. The woman took out this perfumed ointment. It was expensive. And she began to massage it into his bare feet. Simon and his friends were beside themselves because no woman then, except only a woman who I'm here to tell you had earned the reputation this woman had, no woman would have ever done such a thing. That's when Simon looked up from the woman and looked at Jesus and noticed that Jesus didn't seem to be one bit bothered by this. He's shocked. He thought to himself, if this man were really a prophet, really, he would know what kind of woman this is, this woman who is touching him. Now, Simon, of course, didn't know that Jesus, of course, did know what kind of woman this was and also knew what Simon was thinking in this moment about her, about him. And so when the woman's weeping had softened, you know, just to that point where there's these little whimpers, these little sniffles, Jesus, Jesus looked him in the eye and he said, he said, Simon, there was a man who had two people who owed him money. One of them owed him hardly anything. One of them owed him a whole lot, but neither of them could pay the debt. And so he, he, he canceled both of the debts. Then he said, Simon, which of those two debtors do you think would would love the man more. And Simon said, I suppose the one who had the largest debt canceled. Jesus said, indeed. He hoped that would sink in. There's actually no indication that it did. <laughs> and then he, and he looked down at the woman who was still rubbing his feet. And, and, and he let that moment sink in. We don't know if it did. But then finally he said, Simon, I came as a guest to your house. You did not wash my feet. You did not kiss my cheek. This, this woman has done all that. She's done so much more. She loves me more than you do, Simon. She loves God more than you do, Simon. And the reason is because her debt, which was so large, has been canceled. And at that point, Jesus leaned down and with just the the tenderest of touches with his index finger, he put it under her chin and he lifted it up. And then with his thumb, he, he dried a tear off her cheek. And then he said, he looked her in the eye and he said, your sins are forgiven. And Simon and his friends too said to each other, how can he say that? And who does he think he is? And and how can this man who speaks so often about the kingdom of God be so, so cavalier, so not angry about, about this woman who is so morally impure and so obviously far from God? What Simon says to himself then is, if he were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. What Simon didn't understand is that Jesus knew perfectly well what kind of woman this was. And he loved her. So that's our first story. That's the Bible story. The second story I want to tell you is, uh, is my adaptation uh, of a story written uh, by Michael Linval in his book, The Good News from North Haven. It all began after worship one Sunday when Anders Swenson, a, a leathery-faced, oftentimes set in his ways, pillar of the congregation, informed me that his son Andrew, AP, and AP's wife, Charlene, Sherry, who lived in San Francisco, would be visiting soon. Sherry, it seems, had just had, had, just had a baby, a son, and, and they named the son Anders, of all things, Although Grandpa Anders informed me, and the look on his eyes uh, actually s explained what he thought about this, he informed me they'd intend to call the little one Skip. Be that as it may, they were coming to town, and he told me that he had told them 
that uh, he was going to have me, these were his words, he was going to have me do the baby. I assumed correctly that by doing the baby he meant that he wanted the child baptized and, and I pulled him into my office where I asked him to the parents, want their child baptized? Are they, are they willing publicly to make the promise we ask parents at a baptism to raise their child in the faith and to teach them the commandments and the Lord's Prayer and the Creed and to, to, to bring them to, to, to worship in, in their church out there? And Andrew said he didn't know. He hadn't talked to them about any of that, although he did tell me that that they really hadn't had time. They were quite busy out there in California. They really hadn't had time to find a church, which I understand that happens. But I was a little under, less understanding when I found out that they'd been living in San Francisco now for 14 years. <laughs> I told Anders I didn't want to do a baptism without some assurance of the parents' commitment to raise their child in the faith, and I couldn't promise to do a baptism without having that talk with them first. Anders was quiet. He didn't argue. He said, well, okay, if that's how you feel. And then he thanked me for his time. And I um, I'm kind of, was kind of naive. I thought that would be that. Uh, turns out Anders is a member of the church council, and he called a special meeting of the church council where they voted 9-0 to zero in favor of the baptism and then informed me that I would be doing it. Two weeks later, we did little Anders skip Swenson. Now, Grace Lutheran, and I've never heard of another church that does this, Grace Lutheran has this kind of unique but really kind of nice custom at baptisms that I'm told that, that they've done as long as anybody can remember. At every baptism, during the ceremony, the pastor at one point always asks, who stands with this child? And then the whole extended family of the child does stand, and they remain standing throughout the baptism. So two weeks later, with little Skip in front of me, I asked, who stands with this child? And up stood Anders and his wife, Doris, and some aunts and uncles and three or four dozen cousins. After worship, everybody went home, and I went back into the sanctuary to turn off the lights, and a, a, a middle-aged woman, kind of, um, kind of consignment shop style, clothes actually was sitting in the front pew and I recognized her as someone who had been coming to worship the last few months but she always sat way in the back and she always snuck out like like during the last hymn and so I never got a chance to find out even who she was she seemed to want to know something or say something but she also seemed hesitant I, she finally did tell me that her name was Mildred Corey and that she thought the baptism was just beautiful after a little more pause, she, she said that her daughter Tina had just had a baby. And, I mean, the child should be baptized, right? I told her that Tina and her husband should call me, and by all means, we would arrange the baptism. She hesitated again, and then she said, Tina's, Tina, Tina's got no husband. She's, uh, she's just 16. She said she came here for confirmation before you got here, she came for about a year and a half, but then she's, she started to see this older boy. And Mildred paused. This was obviously hard for her. She said then she got pregnant, and the father didn't want nothing to do with the baby, but she wants to have him baptized, but she's scared to talk to you. She named him James, Jimmy. Well, I told her I would, I would have to visit with Tina, and I did. I visited with the two of them together, and then I told them that I would be happy to do the baptism. But at a Grace Lutheran, there was one more thing that they've always done, and that is that at Grace Lutheran, all baptisms were approved by the council. When I brought it up at their next meeting, I started to explain what it turns out everybody in the room already knew, and that is that Tina Corey was a member of the church and was just 16, and I didn't know who the father was. They all knew who the father was, of course. This was a small town. <laughs> the, the father was Jimmy Cheevers, who had just recently and kind of suddenly enlisted in the Marines. But they did have some questions, the consistent theme of which was, how could we be sure that now 
all of a sudden, after, after all the poor decisions she'd made in her life, like quitting confirmation and getting pregnant, how could we be sure that Tina would stick to the faith commitment she was making in having her child baptized? Well, memories of a 9-0 to zero vote to veto my plan to ask little Skip Swenson's mom and dad the very same types of questions were very fresh in my mind, and I could feel my face warming as I listened to them, all of a sudden now wanting to ask those questions this time, but I stayed fairly calm as I told them, we can be sure about these things because I have talked to her. And she wants to raise her child in the faith. Besides, I said, she and little Jimmy live right here in town where we can help her raise her child in the faith. Nothing more was said. The baptism was scheduled for the following Sunday. And the church was full. When the time came, I invited Tina up and she made her way forward, just her and her little two-month-old baby boy and, and she smiled at me but it was a nervous smile and as she got closer I tell, she just looked so young and she got closer and I could see she was shaking I read the opening part of the service thinking, thinking that Mildred Mildred Corey looked so out of place just sitting there in the second pew from the front and sitting, instead of sitting way over the back and she looked, she looked nervous too and then it was time and I said who stands with this child then I, I gave her the most encouraging smile I could and just awkwardly returning my smile she, she stood up and then I looked down at my liturgy book and I was ready to ask Tina the questions about, about her commitment to the spiritual nurturing of, her nurturing of her child when I became aware of a movement I looked up and I saw that Anders Swenson in his blue serge suit had stood up and Doris stood beside him and then a couple more council members and then the Sunday school superintendent and then this one young couple that had just joined the church until finally the entire congregation was standing there with Tina and little Jimmy. Tina was crying of course. Mildred was blinking back tears holding on to the pew in front of her. The inspect unexpectedness of this really was a tiny bit disquieting for a moment, but then there was just this marvelous quiet that took hold of us. Even, even little Jimmy, who'd, who'd been kind of squirming, was now still. James, Alan, Corey, I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And for a moment there was just this profound silence. I could feel that every eye was on this child who in that moment was everybody's child. And that's when I glanced up and I saw Anders Swenson leaning to the side and straining to see little Jimmy from five pews back. And that cantankerous old man was looking at that child with an open-mouthed smile on his face. And I'm the one who started blinking back tears when I saw there was a tear streaming down his leathery old cheek, too. After worship, I was greeting people at the back door when Anders came through with a baby in his arms, little Jimmy. Pastor, he said to me, Doris and I are having dinner at our house this noon, and Mildred and Tina and little Jimmy are going to come. We wondered if maybe you and the missus would like to come. So me and the missus did. And for reasons I'm sure I don't have to explain, it was the best Sunday dinner I've ever had. And there you go, two stories about two men, one of whom threw a dinner party where a young woman with a reputation wasn't welcome. And another of whom threw a dinner party where a young woman with a reputation was the guest of honor. Simon didn't get it, you see. Anders, on the other hand, eventually did. The question for this morning is do we? Do we get 
that the church is called to stand against sin. I mean, oh my goodness, the church is called to stand against sin, to be sure. But the church is called also to stand with sinners, to be sure. Do you get it? I want to suggest that the answer to that question is not just found when, with repentance and love, we turn to the Father. That question is answered when, with forgiveness and love and compassion, too, we turn to our sisters and our brothers. And to which sister or brother should we turn with forgiving and compassionate love? That's very easy. Turn to the ones who need it. And why would you do that? Well, that's easy too. Do it for the sake of the forgiveness and compassion and love and amazing grace of he who, when he saw your need, turned to a cross. Amen.